Good evening, <clears throat> and welcome to this panel on war and politics. My name is Eric Jones, and I'm co-editor of a journal called Government and Opposition. Um, we're a, co a journal of comparative politics, uh, and this is the editorial team. I'm also director of the Robert Schuman Center at the European University Institute, so we're academics who edit journals. <clears throat> this is my co-editor, Laura Cram. <clears throat> Laura is professor of European politics at the University of Edinburgh. This is our Robert LG fellow, <clears throat> who is Veronica Angel. She's lecturer in international political risk at the Johns Hopkins University in Bologna, Italy. And this is our Mick Moran fellow, Adrian Favero. <clears throat> and Adrian is assistant professor of European politics and society at the University of Groningen. Now, the reason that we're here today is to talk to you a bit about something that's not yet in the news. And in order to have that conversation with you, uh, what we want to do is set some very basic ground rules and, and then begin to develop an argument. The basic ground rules are those with which you'll be familiar as regular participants at events here at Chatham House. The first is if you could please turn off your cell phone. That would be a great assistance. The second basic ground rule is that we're all going to engage in our conversation. I welcome you, our audience in-house, uh, but we also have a substantial audience online who deserve our welcome and attention as well. And so what we'll do at a certain point is draw you into the conversation. When we do so, if you want to ask a question, the request from Chatham House is that you remain seated and they will bring a boom mic so that you can speak from a seated position in comfort. Those of you who are online, you have the opportunity to introduce your questions into the Q&A box. When you introduce your questions into the Q&A box, we'll answer them and weave them into the conversation uh, as well as we can, perhaps also combining them with those questions uh, on the floor. We have at least 200 participants online, so we're not going to ask them to unmute themselves. Um, <clears throat> but we will try to get through as many of your questions and their questions as we possibly can. I should finish with one thing that those of you who are members of Chatham House will obviously know. As a member's event, this event is on record. It's being live streamed. There's no confidentiality about what we say in this room, but that's OK. We're academics. There's nothing that we say that we would ever want to keep secret in any event. <laughs> Look, I introduced this conversation as something that's not quite in the news. We've all been absorbed by the horrible violence that's being wrought in Ukraine right now, by the back and forth of the military conflict, by the tragic events that have taken place, and by the groundswell of support across Europe and the United States to support the Ukrainians in this fight. But there is another part of the story that we're going to face, a part of the story that has to do with the ability of societies in Western Europe and Eastern Europe to remain committed to this support. And that remaining committed ability is going to be challenging because of the inflation that we know is already underway because of the accelerating increases in food prices and energy prices, because of the demands of regular kitchen table items on the political agenda that must be faced, and because of the opportunities that such demands create for opposition to challenge government and for government to become divided. So what we thought we would do is begin to offer you a little bit of a preview of what we think this domestic politics is going to look like. We're not here as experts in military conflict or strategic studies. We're here as editors of a journal that focuses on comparative politics, that specializes in issues related to democratic dysfunction and populism, to party politics and coalition dynamics. And hopefully, with your help, will begin to ask the, the questions and shape the conversation that we know will begin to dominate the news as summer gives into autumn and autumn gives into winter and energy prices and food prices become ever more important. So that's our agenda. In that agenda, I think the first thing that we want to ask ourselves is how 
people are identifying with this conflict. Because we've looked at this European response and seen this tremendous groundswell of solidarity. But this tremendous groundswell of solidarity is refracted in some ways through the European Union, through NATO, through historic relationships. And it's unclear just how stable this is as a construct. So that's why I'm going to go to you first, Laura, and ask you, when you look at what's going on right now, how do you see identity politics playing into the Western response to Ukraine? And how durable do you see the construct of Europe as an identity in this larger effort to keep Ukraine intact and to push back against Russian aggression? Okay, so I think these are really, really challenging questions. And I think it's going to be a story of very, very mixed parts um, and mixed narratives that are going to affect the filters through which people see the European Union. So I think people will actually, and in practice, have very different realities in the fallout from events. It affects different countries in different ways. Different countries already have different relationships in relation to either Russia or to the EU, different perspectives on NATO. But more than that, they also have different lenses through which they're viewing the the, the events and the fallout of the events that are likely to actually affect how they take in and process the information and then decide how it affects their behaviour. So um, one of the things we might ask is, I think you would raise that question of, of whether or not people are going to sustain this position of being positive about the European Union and positive about NATO, or whether once there's more economic fallout, once all these prices rise, then they're going to um, pull away. And I think one of the things that we found really, really interesting in looking at the different identity dynamics is the way that identity actually affects our interpretation of what we might think of as objective facts. So the same price rise for different people who identify with different units can actually be perceived as higher or lower. A great example of this is, is, is in the Brexit campaign, where we actually saw people who we thought and were presented as acting economically irrationally, because it was actually the very people who might be hit hardest that voted in the largest number. And we saw that they were actually more concerned with, with con control identity, with a sense of, of self-efficacy, if you like. And I think there's going to be part of that in the European Union fallout, that when we have different groups, and we've already seen that, for example, um, Bulgaria, Greece, Hungary have a very different attitude towards some parts of the sanctions and where we sh whether we should be focusing on trade or whether we should be focusing on defence. And they have a very different attitude, too, to historic relations and current relationships with, with Russia. Um, so what we actually find in many of the psychological identity studies is that depending on where you're identifying, you might actually perceive the cost, which the cost, actually in monetary terms, might be exactly the same. You'll perceive it as more or less punitive. And that, I think, will have a really fundamental effect on a really variegated fallout from this. Shall I pause or move on? <laughs> no, 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 Laura, I think, that, I, I, I think that's a really powerful idea, right? That, that people are going to look at the same facts and come up with a different interpretation. But I guess, I, I guess what we need is to introduce some kind of structure on what we mean by who the people are, right? Um, Adrian, maybe I could bring you in on this. Um, the historic relationships that Laura is referring to could be the historic relationships between, say, right-wing extremist parties and the Russian government, for example. Uh, and, and so is there a sense in which right and left, populist and mainstream divisions in politics that we see replicated across countries are actually changing fundamentally the way people in Western Europe or Central and Eastern Europe view this conflict? I would go back if, a few years um, because between what happens now and the war in Crimea, we did actually see that a lot of uh, right-wing populist parties um, did um, what the media often call cozy up to Putin uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, we saw Le Pen um, taking loans uh, from, from Russian banks. We saw Salvini uh, going to the, the Red Square, um, meeting Putin, wearing a, a, a T-shirt in public. And 
that had a lot to do because for, for a lot of right-wing populist parties, um, what Putin embodied was very much um, how they saw themselves. Um, relatively conservative, authoritarian, um, nationalist, and, and Putin embodied all that. Um, on top of that, also anti-LGBTQ rights, looking at some right-wing populist parties, such as, for example, the Peace in Poland, um, who is not necessarily pro-Putin, but it's an element of a lot of um, right-wing populist parties to be relatively conservative, also when it cult comes to cultural issues. Um, now, with the war in, in Russia, obviously that has changed, and a lot of right-wing populist parties did have to backtrack. Um, and I'm sure you have seen it in the media, where a lot of newspapers were saying, oh, now we see a shift in, in political attitude. Um, we see right-wing populist parties backtracking, and, and they have to do some, they have some explaining to do. Well, the matter of fact, what we should be aware is that across Europe, just because a party is right-wing populist and, and shares an ideology with other parties doesn't mean they behave all in the same way. Um, it doesn't mean that, for example, what happened to Salvini, who was publicly humiliated by a major in, in Przemysl at the Ukraine-Polish border, would happen to other parties. Uh, another example is, for example, uh, the ruling party in Poland, uh, Law and Justice Party, who has been throughout very anti-Russia for historical reasons. Uh, so when we talk about potential shifts in party politics, also looking at predominantly at the populist political right, um, we should be aware that they're not all the same and they don't also have the same agenda, depending on the different countries. There are some uh, pr predominantly uh, Salvini, as I've mentioned, and also Le Pen, who uh, I think before the campaign they had to destroy 1.2 million leaflets where she did a handshake with Putin, it was a bit of an embarrassment. Um, but other, other parties, populist, right-wing parties, have been less affected, such as the Swiss People's Party in Switzerland, um, or the AfD in, in Germany, um, who has not been as affected as Salvini and Le Pen in public elections. So <clears throat> this point you make about right and left then seems to become a little bit more idiosyncratic, less structural, makes it harder for us to begin analysis. Maybe that's not the cleavage we should focus on. Maybe the cleavage we should focus on is between those countries that, that have the bad fortune of having to live close to Russia and, and those countries that live farther away. Veronica, maybe you could help us out. Do you think that the countries of Central and Eastern Europe are viewing this conflict in a different way from the countries of Western Europe? Or do you think that there's a sense of we're all in this together uh, looking at the war in Ukraine? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that the countries of Central and Eastern Europe have their moment of I told you so right about now, or at least on February 24th, um, when Russia invaded Ukraine. But um, if you think about what's going to happen next, and going back to your original conversation about domestic politics, it's not really that hard to anticipate how uh, the politics of several of these countries are going to uh, be shaped in the near future. We already see that there is a trend of um, elites being highly opportunistic, and this is not different from what we've also seen in the countries of the West. But the problem in Central and Eastern Europe is that the national and supranational incentives um, are, the structural incentives are already in place to co-opt the population in uh, subverting uh, democratic institutions. So when you have elites who have an interest to centralize power for their own self-interest, and at the same time you have a population um, that has converged significantly towards attitudes, uh, more liberal attitudes that you, you would encounter in Western Europe, but not entirely due to a, a lot of reasons, then you can have a very toxic cocktail and the outcome doesn't sound that great. So if you already read the news in the last couple of days, you can see that Prime Minister uh, Viktor Orban has taken um, uh, the occasion of, yet of this crisis to extend a state of emergency um, in Hungary. This was highly predictable. So the state of emergency that he had imposed for uh, COVID that allows him to rule by decree should have expired on uh, June 1st. 
and um, now it will be continued because of the war um, in, in Ukraine. And under this rule, um, the profits of what he considers um, excessive profits from m many m companies, including energy, telecom, and other companies <coughs> that are not directly uh, controlled by his immediate um, friends, um, are going to be put in this special fund to alleviate economic problems of Hungary. And another thing that they've also decided, going back to populism, is that country, um, cars uh, that have a license plate with Hungarian number uh, will pay a different price for fuel uh, compared to foreigners who go through the country. So right now there are all these practicalities of uh, you know, populism in action that go and really hit you know, the, these kind of immediate needs from the population uh, to feel that they are being taken care of under conditions of stress. So even if the situation, and this is just um, one example, it's the, what we all talk about, maybe we can come back with what the EU is doing uh, to take care of this, uh, or to not take care of this kind of situations, but you have other countries that are flying below the radar, such as Romania and Bulgaria, who rarely talk about, who are also members of the European Union, and where reform has been stagnating in terms of you know, corruption, transparency in public procurement, um, um, all, all sorts of um, uh, the independence <coughs> of ju judiciary, uh, the, um, the have, having different uh, media outlets to not control the information environment, and, and these have also stalled under the the conditions of these crises. So as long as you have these elites, opportunistic elites, who are not trained to put the idea of democracy in, you know, at the top of their list, um, we, it may not be very different from other uh, politicians in Western Europe, but you couple that with the erosion of liberal attitudes and a, a fragile democratic uh, structure, and um, yeah, you have a very different uh, uh, story that comes out of Central and Eastern Europe. Now, this, this different story that comes out of Central and Eastern Europe is not isolated from the rest of Europe, because it's all connected through the institutions of the European Union. When we look, for example, at the debate about the sixth round of sanctions, a debate that's still ongoing because of the rule of law controversy that's been raised between the European Commission and Hungary and the Hungarian government's insistence that there be greater support for Hungary in the context uh, of its energy transition for them to agree for the sanctions to, to come into place. Um, I, I have to wonder how long the public narrative of solidarity can last. Um, and, and, and Laura, I, I guess I'm even more concerned when I look at the millions of Ukrainians who have been displaced into Poland uh, and, and begin to wonder, they're there now and integrating into the labor market, but if this war drags on, how long are they going to be satisfied to stay in Poland? And what will be the impact when they begin to migrate to other countries, not as temporary refugees, but looking for a longer place to stay? So maybe you could help us with that, because it seems like when solidarity takes on this very personal dimension, the opportunities for European integration uh, uh, or, or, or European expression uh, become diminished. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess, like our great starting point with all of this is any sense of European identity, no matter how vociferously it's, it's in, embraced in, in these kind of moments, is contingent and it is contextual. And that's always been the, the story, um, not, not just in the European Union, but at, at the national level, we're willing to um, assign much more support at times where we feel we're getting better benefits from whatever structure we're, we're, we're in. And that was really the classic of, of Karl Deutsch's understanding of functional nationalism, that we would, um, when we would quite willingly, in fact, and sometimes people see this as quite controversial because they're quite attached to their national identities, but that we would quite willingly transfer our identity up or down the scale of authorities if we felt one was satisfying our functional needs better than another. Um, and I think that's where your, your question really arises, that at the moment there's this embrace and we're all Europeans and how can we welcome everybody in? But um, Helen Thompson, our, our colleague at, at GNO and also a distinguished 
English professor, um, um, has written about that rather thin um, veneer of this notion of Ukrainian European identity and that that will be sorely tested as, as these issues come up. But I think there is something in that story, though, from the Deutschian perspective that gives us maybe not, not hope, but brings more nuance, which is that it, it really that functional benefit that you get from identity doesn't have to be economic. Um, and that actually a sense of belonging is um, something very rational to pursue. And it helps us explain the initial uh, creation of the European Union. It helps us to explain the banding together just now, and very much in the story of it almost as a security community, which is part of the, 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 the one of the early interpretations of this type of um, bonding together, again, a, a Deutschian perspective. And I think when you start to look like that, that gives you some slightly different questions to ask, because that's when you do get the question of, who are the us and who are the them in this scenario? Are we identifying with the EU? Are we identifying with our nation? Are we identifying? And we know that across the European Union, there are some groups of countries that see the bad guy in this story as Russia and others within the European Union who see the bad guys as the way that the EU and NATO are, are acting. And those us and thems are part of the lenses through which they're going to interpret um, their welcome to individuals as they come to Europe. It's how they're going to interpret. Um, in fact, um, with my other hat on, I run the Neuropolitics Research Lab and we look at how we process our understanding of people and how our identities can change our ability to humanize others, to actually understand the pain <coughs> that others are in. And if we see somebody as a them and not as an us, we don't attribute the same mental capacity, we don't contribute theory of mind to them, and we're actually quite able to be quite punitive ourselves with impunity, if you like. So I think that will be part of that variegated story in terms of how the fallout will come. And a lot of it will depend on the narrative of whether or not the EU maintains this, this um, sense that what we're doing is good, we all belong together, we have to be in this for the long haul, and whether those narratives can carry far enough to affect the filters through which people interpret, because facts are not really facts, <coughs> they interpret the, the realities. I feel. So what you're saying, Laura, actually raises two questions. And I think one of them I, I would address to Adrian. And it actually was asked by Amerik Conry online. Um, and, and the question is, Adrian, you know, if we talk about Deutschian security communities, you know, is there really the possibility that the populists, either within countries, um, Western European countries, the populist politicians, or the populists who control Central and East European countries like Orban, will look around and say, wait a minute, Russia is not our ally. Russia is, is actually our threat. And the only allies we have are in the West. And they'll, they'll break with this past behavior that's proven so po problematic and, and, and become more part of the security community, the, the shared identity, the political project. It's a good question. Um, well, number one, it's the nature of a populist party not to side with the elites. So that, that's sort of the ground floor, that as a populist party, I always side with the pure people um, against the corrupt elite. So therefore, it's sort of a difficult starting point to say, are they becoming part of this whole narrative where we're all like one and we all want security? Of course, um, as I mentioned before, they had to backtrack some of them. Um, and, and some of them are also now realizing they are currently, with the current ev events unfolding, they're not powerful enough to have much of a say. Um, because Laura mentioned before that um, we're having this moment of, of identity, but it's not a, a, a moment that is shared across Europe because some part, um, countries have a different view than others. And that is also very much then met with actual politics because having this moment of identity is fine and saying, hey, we're more united as, as, as an EU or also as a NATO where we have two new countries maybe joining or not, but 
that also has to be met with current politics. And in most countries, we don't see populists in power. Uh, in most countries, it's the so-called mainstream parties that have to figure out what are the next steps. And it's also the mainstream parties that are largely in charge to continue with this moment of identity. And, it, and, and that's hard work, right? We, see, we saw lately, um, if you've followed the news, uh, there's this debate, uh, it was Germany too late um, in participating with hard weapons? Why is the Chancellor Olaf Scholz not visiting Kiev? Everyone else has, right? And that's a debate that is bypassing the populist parties because they're not in charge or in a position where they can influence current policies and what to do because at the end of the day it's very much hands on what are the next steps and identity is part of it and the sort of this Europeanization of, of current political affairs is part of it but it's also the states that decide what to do and in most states, Poland being the example, uh, Hungary being another example, um, where populist right-wing parties are in power, but in most states it's very much the mainstream parties. And I would like to add this, um, while the war in Ukraine is unfolding, um, unfortunately uh, European societies, as any other society, also has a, a bit of a tendency um, to be very excited and following an event when it happens, um, and the longer it takes, um, the more bored we get. Um, it's a bit like watching a four-hour movie when at some point we're like, okay, that could have been shortened to 90 minutes. It would have been more interesting. Um, so what I want to say is countries are also faced with other things that are still happening, right? There's still COVID. Um, I've just seen today that in the UK now we talk about the party gate again. Um, so there's these other issues where then populist parties may focus on that because it's more beneficial to look at these issues and it's for, to um, gain support by um, their fellow countrymen instead of harping on with the war in Ukraine that is very much uh, being dealt with at the European level or national level by so-called mainstream parties. So the, the, this response to the first question that, that Laura's comments raised, I think feeds right into the second question. It's something that Hans Kudnani is, is asking online in a couple of different issues, and it's all about European identity as a kind of an imagined community. Uh, but, but it's, I think, given a, a sharper point by something that Oded Meyer asks. Let's imagine, Veronica, that, that in this context of solidarity, all Europeans are to be treated equal, but as, but as Adrian says, it's the states that decide I don't think all states are going to be treated equal. And Adid Mayer's point is, all those people who want the movie to end more quickly, how much agency are they going to allow the Ukrainians in deciding the peace? Uh, and, and, and if they don't allow the Ukrainians that agency, what are they really saying about the Ukrainians as members of the European community? Because if we force them to settle early, are we saying that they have they have a lesser standing from other parts. Okay, so that was 20 questions. <laughs> um, all right, so, okay, let's talk about the war, right? And I'm, I should have to say as a disclaimer, I am from Central and Eastern Europe, so pardon the doom and gloom. It's not going great, right? We keep having this kind of wishful thinking scenarios that at some point it will stop, the movie will end, uh, sooner rather than later, there will be some territories given up by the Ukrainians and, and the Russians having realized what a great mistake they've done, they will now live in peace and harmony with everybody else. And uh, that is just not how things are going to, to look like. Um, no matter what happens in these occupied territories, you will have insurrections that are the outcome um, of the Ukrainian politics and Ukrainian people's agency and also a highly militarized, a highly radicalized uh, part of the, of the army and the population as well. You also have, we also have to remember that you know, Ukraine borders NATO countries, several NATO countries. That means that they will have constant access to uh, regroup, to get um, uh, more uh, resources, uh, to get military uh, resources as well. So this is not something that's going to 
end soon, and we can't really think of, of that possibility. Um, uh, and j just thinking about it with, is really doing everyone um, a disservice. But going, and that's one thing. The other one, thinking about solidarity and how ready people are to support Ukraine in the, in the long run and how they perceive themselves in the East. So the whole conversation right now is about these buffer zones, right? That there was a, a structural plan to keep certain areas in this very you know, ungodly way in, in, a, in a twilight zone that is neither east nor west as long as they are in a buffer zone between uh, the east and the west. And through sh desire, through agencies, through different conditions, a lot of people said no to that. But we have to in Ukraine, in Moldova, in Georgia, in other places. The role of this strategy that you might find or might associate with Western countries or the US or even NATO, nevertheless has also had an impact in the way that countries create their own uh, politics. And this goes back to what also Adrian was saying. The countries of Central and Eastern Europe were also glad to buy into the whole buffer zone further to the east. As the Russians are moving closer, they're starting to feel like, oh, so now are we the buffer zone? And this will change internal politics in the sense that all you hear about you know, supporting the process of enlargement that the countries of Central and Eastern Europe are, are you know, using this rhetoric in favor of is actually just paying lip service. It is not something that they follow on the ground. They do not invest in the enlargement process of either European Union or NATO through diplomacy, through intelligence, through army, through anything, because it's also in their strategic planning to have these unfortunate buffer zones between themselves and Russia. And this is just you know, real politics that also exists in the East. And in this way, these countries are not any different. So yes, there is solidarity in trying to keep these countries, unfortunately, in these twilight zone, let's call it that way, keeping them closer to the West, but not fully in the West, not sharing that many resources with them, but some resources with them, keeping them in somehow our, our sphere of, of influence, but not really being responsible for them because we don't have the bandwidth to deal with other people with pop kind of politics that are already a, a problem for the member states of, of the European Union. So it's, it's not an, um, a fortunate situation that uh, Ukraine is in uh, politically right now, though militarily it's going to be supported um, a lot. So, and I will get to you in just a second. I'm going to ask one more question for Laura just to clear out the online, and then we'll bring conversations from the audience in the room. Um, Laura, I guess the point that Veronica is making really has two different aspects to it. You know, one is, you know, is it safe for us to say, that despite all these nuances, and this comes from Yusuf Ishik uh, online, despite all these nuances, that European identity has been strengthened, right? That there's been some baseline strengthening of affiliation identification with the European project. Um, and then the other aspect of this, um, <clears throat> which is a question from Beth Laffin, uh, is, is really, is it European identity that's been strengthened, or is it Western identity? Is it, is it about NATO and the transatlantic relationship and the security that provides that's been strengthened? Uh, because I think sorting those two things out might help us a little bit in this conversation. Oh, and I think they're also really related questions as well. Um, so, um, yeah, so just at the moment on the measures, Yes, we have seen a rise in attachment to the European Union, and that, that, that is 
emergent. We've seen quite a lot of positivity about a lot of the activities, um, but that has been linked a lot in the surveys with also attitudes towards NATO um, and a strengthening of a sense of um, efficacy in that, that relationship, which has always been a bit of a problematic relationship. But that also fits, I think, with that question about imagined communities and the fact that there never really was one imagined community of the European Union. There have always been multiple imaginings. And for some people, that imagining always did involve that Western, broader NATO um, relationship. And for others, it was never really about the European Union. It was about a broader Europe. And that also relates to that question of where do these boundaries of Europe and where do our historical narratives and even our own reinvented mythological narratives of bringing ourselves back as a, as a broader um, Europe relate. So, um, yeah, I think there is, a, there is a, 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 a presented rise. We know that it takes very little to create a minimal group identity. So um, something positive in the short term is there, whether it has the depths and the legs or whether it's actually shared and we're all actually talking about the same thing when we say we're more attached. I think not. I think so. it is a combination of those identities and imaginings. OK, that's very helpful. I'm going to come back to this as we imagine different ways that this could go horribly wrong, not least because of <laughs> the political developments in the United States. Uh, but, but I'm conscious that I don't want to use up all this time without bringing in voices from the room as well. So you, sir, you had your hand up. If you could identify yourself when asking your question, that would help us better to keep track of the question flow. Um, actually, it's the person in the second row right here. My name is Igor Latsanich, and this is mostly uh, towards uh, Ms. Engel. I wanted to ask, so knowing what happened with the occupations of Ukraine, that being the DPR and LPR, where those were the buffer areas from which uh, further attacks started recently, uh, would you say that Europe's support for Ukraine would continue in order to stop those zones from growing? And if so, would you say that it would possibly include them putting in forces in order to make sure that those that those zones don't increase any more than they have already or even more than they have by now because that would once again bring them closer to play to uh, Western Europe so Hungary and Poland as, 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 and so on Veronica do you want to yeah Are you just refer referring to the south occupied territories so or? South, again, yes so we have every signal that comes from both the United States Army which is very important specifically which more or less means NATO and the countries that are bordering Ukraine and member states individually, that they will keep supporting Ukraine militarily with humanitarian aid um, and with um, uh, hitting Russia where they've managed to decide that they can work together and if not individually. So in that area, yes. You've asked whether there will be troops on the ground. No, absolutely not. There is absolutely no indication that there is a desire for, uh, to put uh, NATO troops on the ground. And you cannot send either the army of individual member states because even if you don't say it's a NATO operation, you send a Romanian or a Bulgarian soldier, that's a NATO operation. That is too high a risk and it's, it's not uh, likely to happen. What will happen will be covert operations that will also take uh, place um, at different levels of the political um, political arena. I should, I should say we don't often speak outside of our comparative politics brief, uh, but Veronica Angel was uh, junior foreign affairs advisor to Romanian President Klaus Johannes for two years, uh, responsible for the during NATO the desk uh, during the Crimean conflict. So, so we, we allow her to speak off the reservation in that context. Another you, point. sir. We told you so. <laughs> we told you so. <laughs> My name is Alessandro Rosselli, a Chatham House member. And uh, what is missing, in my opinion, in this conversation, not only in this room, but also outside this room, is uh, what is the final purpose of our policy? The reason for that is that, uh, actually, there is not a single purpose. There is, a, at least uh, looking from uh, Italy, I would say from Europe, and increasing evidence that the purposes of the Americans are at least slightly, not so slightly different from the purpose 
uh, the purposes of the Europeans. And having this in, in mind, uh, I wonder whether the purpose of this exercise might be the following. Uh, I, I, I remember a, an American diplomat whose name is, was George Cannon, and uh, he had uh, the doctrine, exposed the doctrine of uh, containment of uh, the Soviet Union. The, this policy has been wonderful. We have lived for decades with a Soviet Union, a totally different system, without the liberty and so on, but in peace. These, uh, the consequences of this have been sometimes horrible. For example, we did not intervene in, in the Hungarian Revolution. We were basically totally indifferent to that and other cases. I'm saying this, but not because I don't want to be so rigid uh, in, in, this, in this matter. But I wonder whether our approach should be different. The, the approach at that time was different because uh, we were very well aware that uh, the Soviet Union was extremely strong and dangerous. Now, uh, after the Soviet Union, we are also aware that uh, Russia is weak. Okay? And we had the temptation to do that, to defy Russia. This is, this is bad, in my opinion, because a, a, a weak enemy, but with uh, okay, the nuclear power, can do things that we cannot, or possibly we can imagine. So I would say the doctrine of containment should be considered again. So, <clears throat> Mr. Roselli, there's, a, there's an Italian diplomat whose name is Sergio Romano, uh, and Sergio Romano was the last Italian ambassador to the Soviet Union. And I think what he would say is that we have to find some way to live with Russia. The challenge, of course, is, is finding some way to live with this current group of Russian leadership, which I think has become quite challenging, not least given the way that efforts to bring some closure to the annexation of Crimea and the occupation of elements of the Donbass has only fueled, as <clears throat> the gentleman pointed out, has only fueled uh, this further conflict. So there's something that's not, not quite going right in that context here. Um, having said that, and, and this is the point I would, I would embrace, I have a piece coming out in the latest issue of survival that makes this argument. We must begin now planning how we will live with Russia in the future, because Russia is not going to go anywhere. Um, and the, the question that I have for my panelists is what happens if our planning goes somehow terribly wrong, uh, which is the point that you're raising about escalation. Um, if there is an escalation in this conflict, what does that do to the political identities that are in play here? Uh, before the whole thing started in uh, late uh, January, I wrote a letter to the FT and to other newspapers, and they kindly published that, where I uh, asked for an accommodation similar to Austria after the Second World War. That is a neutral country. You, you, we know that uh, Austria cannot be a member of NATO, but <laughs> in time it became, it, they became members of the European Union and so on. Why not to do the same for Ukraine? Now it's extremely difficult, possibly impossible, but when I wrote, and before everything started, I wondered whether the American diplomats in, in Geneva uh, raised this openly, this question to the Russians. Would you agree about a neutral, without NATO, a neutral Ukraine? Can I just briefly Please, answer Veronica. That? So, and then you can go to other questions. Um, that is not possible because that is not Ukraine's option. It's simply put, what Austria decided, decided for uh, itself. Buffer, Ukraine does you, not. You I, talk of states. That's it. That is what it's a structure imposed from the outside. They have agency, and in the end, they're the only ones who can decide what to do. We cannot impose neutrality on a country that's fighting for its own territory and its people. Sir. Um, Michael Remmers, a member of Chatham House. Um, I, my, my question is on keeping European unity. Will that be possible if some countries become less and less democratic? And, and how do you see that developing? 
because I think that this issue is an issue that people try to put put away and put forward or away from the discussions at, 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 in Brussels, but it's becoming more and more problematic. How, how can we keep unity in Europe with, with that going on? Adrian, do you want to give a stab at this one? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if the gentleman refers to a specific well, Hungary. Hungary, and I assume Poland. Poland. Yeah. Um, because what I would say is you're absolutely right. I mean, there have been uh, illiberal tendencies in, in both of these countries. Uh, in Hungary, uh, there was a censorship of, of the media. Um, there was corruption. Uh, the Polish government undermined the, the, the justice system, uh, the media system. Um, there's a lot, a lot of illiberal tendencies going on. However, they have been going on before the war in Ukraine started. So that has been an issue and, and something that the EU had to deal with um, pre previously. Um, the problem is that, and, and this is a, a bit of a structural issue, the EU has only a limited capacity to interfere with what happens within nation states. So if Poland decides um, to, to fiddle with their justice system, the EU has only so much they can do to tell the Poland, please stick to democratic rules or stick to uh, what we think is democratic. Because of course, Poland, or if you talk to the Polish government, they would have a completely different opinion because they, they think, no, we're actually doing the right thing. But the, the EU is, is relatively powerless when it comes to interference with what happens within nation states. There are certain elements, and they're, they're usually tied to cohesion funding and, and money, but they are not as widespread as we sometimes may like. Yeah, uh, my name is Mohamed Tentosh, and I'm also a member of Chatham House. Actually, I have two questions. Well, uh, if it's from international like perspective, what is the changes in the international arrangements that should have or that should be done after the Ukraine. Listen, I'm talking about having a reference line of what is wrong and what is right, because you cannot in, in one moment say that what happened, the invasion in Iraq or Afghanistan, or even the, inter, the Russian invasion in, in, in Syria is right, and you can say like silent about it or support it, or even support it. And the other day you come to see that to say that the Russian invasion to Ukraine is wrong. So what should, how we can build a reference line that we should measure and make actions according to? And the other question is, what the change that should be done in the uh, Security Council? Because if we still support the, uh, the idea about the, 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 the devil here is Russia, then we cannot keep some devils that control all the world, just four or five countries who are I mean, controlling everything in terms of security and, 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 and uh, the, the, the decision in the world, I think. So what change should be done here? Thank you. These are, uh, these are challenging questions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let anybody volunteer who wants to answer. Veronica, do you want to? Sure. <laughs> the Texas approach to volunteering. <laughs> So on the question on how do we preserve unity when we have countries that challenge uh, democracy within the European Union at great cost. We have lowered our standards for uh, what is democracy at different levels of the European Union. Um, and we are paying in, within the European Union for having done that. So uh, we can see that these countries are now shaping the rule of law culture inside the European Union. And we can see how, at a moment of great stress, Hungary is negotiating for more money when the question is not about money right now. So at great cost, we are preserving this unity. And it will come back and bite us in the. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> The other question on uh, what, we, what could we do on the Security Council, how to reform it? You, you can't. You can't. This is it. The only question that we can pose 
um, right now, I mean, I'm not a specialist in this particular thing. I'm sure there are people who, uh, no, now I'm talking like a woman. I have opinions, so it doesn't matter. So um, the, the, you can't change unless you change the goal a bit. So the question is how much do we still take into account what the Security Council does when it is a, um, um, a body that is dysfunctional in, at the right times, right? So that is, um, that is the, the, the larger question here. Adrian, do you want to do the right and wrong? Yeah, because I think it's, it's interesting. It's also a question that I got often asked by my students. Like, why is America allowed to invade Iraq and, you know, and Russia is not? Like, why are we behaving differently? Um, why is different? Why are we talking differently about it? Um, why are we taking different actions? And I think uh, one thing that came to mind when you asked this question was uh, John Mersheimer. And John Mersheimer said, in a, in a world where there is anarchy and there is, um, and I am aware that it's controversial to bring John Mersheimer into this. I'm using a quote. <laughs> um, he said, in a, in a in a situation where there's anarchy and nobody trusts each other, you'd rather be Godzilla than Bambi. Meaning that, unfortunately, or that's just the way it is, um, we say all states are equal because there's no power above the states. But matter of fact, some states are more powerful than others. And the US is one of the most powerful countries or players among all the states. And yes, that's why they have or can get away with things that other states may not. Um, I usually tell my students, not, not the Godzilla and, and Bambi version, but imagine if, if you could choose to be a country in a, in a world where nobody trusts each other, would you want to be the US or Monaco? Or the US. Yeah, you well, well, most likely want to be the US. Yes. Because they are the US. And, and if Monaco says, hey, we're going to attack some other country, we all find it super funny. Because they don't have the power and the standing to execute what if they want to have more power, and some countries do. I just want to add that at the end of the story, Bambi survives and Godzilla is, dies. So I don't know. I, I haven't seen either of these movies, but. <laughs> You're in the front row. Yes, sir. Paul Schultz from King's and, and Birmingham. I, I wonder if there's a, if we're looking at comparative politics and political reactions in different European countries, I wonder if geography and space, as well as historical memories, um, are good ex 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 explanatory factors and to do with different kinds of strategic risk and anxiety. If, if you're Russia's neighbor, you have the risk of being exposed to Russian, direct Russian conventional attack and threats of attack. That, that's preoccupying. That's been a historical problem. If you're further back, as Germany now is, and France certainly now is, then you're probably not worried about Russian tanks ro rolling over your country again. But what you are worried about, existentially, is nuclear escalation. And the, it seems to me that the differences between those two kinds of risk and, and government responses to them may explain a lot of the difference between hard and soft positions uh, on, what, on how far NATO should go in fighting with the last willing Ukrainian, uh, whatever the cost to, to future relations with a reduced and angry Russia. Do, do you think that, that simple spatial model explains much? Laura, I'm going to go to you, and then we've got one last question before, no, two last questions before we run out of time. Yeah, I think that brought up quite a lot of interesting things. It's what some uh, uh, to do with distance and space and direct impact, so personal interest and the impact that it's actually likely to have on you. But you also raised the issue of anxiety, and anxiety causes really different ways of behaving. So um, when people are angry, they act and, and, and act in a positive and deliberate manner. In anxiety, they tend to be the much more frozen, and that's much more, more challenging if it's closer on your border. But we're also, I think, even at a distance, we're seeing the effects in a very real sense in practice and in identities. You know, if you look at the, the um, northern European countries that are having to really reconsider their whole self-perception of their own identities as neutral spaces, 
Um, today, in fact, in the, the Times, they ran a poll on Scotland's attitudes to NATO. And, and that's really profound and related to their internal identities in terms of what might happen in the next referendum. They very successfully kept that whole thorny NATO issue out of um, the first referendum. But now we've seen that's come right back up to the top of the fore to do with the Ukrainian crisis. So even at a distance without an immediate threat, really digging into deeply intrinsic aspects of identity, internal politics, and um, yeah, what you can and can't keep on and off your agendas in a, in a threat scenario. Okay, I'm, I regret that we're pressed for time, so we're gonna go to the gentleman here and the woman here, um, and then we'll let the panelists respond, and then we'll close uh, at, a, a, at seven o'clock. Is it really possible Ukraine can defeat the beast from the east? And what is the cost of it, despite having NATO as well as independent countries supporting it? That's question A. And the B part of it, now we were talking already in the media that war crimes, the war hasn't even finished yet. Who are we going to take to the war crimes tribunal? Is it Putin? What about the other criminals who are involved in other parts, say, in the Middle East? They committed massive war crimes. Are they going to be subjected to the same allegations? And you, madam? Uh, hi, I'm Nikki. I'm a student at King's. Uh, so first question is about China. How big role China is playing in this sustainability of uh, European solidarity that we reached now? And uh, do you think that's part of the reason why Central European countries are not willing to move more decisively uh, and into like uh, European Union? Uh, and the second question actually is a following question on the challenge on democracy. So is there a bottom line uh, in which we think you know this unity is not uh, you know worth preserving if that's so much you know cost have been cost on the democracy? Thank you very much. Well, excellent. I think that gives us that gives us plenty to finish on in the last two minutes of our conversation. Um, <clears throat> Laura, shall we start with you, then go to Veronica, and then go to Adrian? So if we're in the short, I'm just going to start straight with that democracy question, because I think it's really interesting. I think it's part of those stories of the imaginings of Europe, <laughs> and many of them that were um, nirvana fallacy <laughs> imaginings that it never was as dem democratic as all that, but in terms of whether or not it can backslide and how far it can backslide and whether it's worth maintaining, I think you have to just ex realize how far institutionalized many of the interests are in the maintenance of the European structure. And that over the years, whether it's been the Eurozone crisis or other crises, we've seen lots of times of the thinking of it's ECRIP, it's the end of the EU, it's all going to collapse. And there's been a remarkable institutionalization, res institutional resilience, if you like. And I suspect, whether we like it or not, that even in terms of democracy and democratic backsliding, that entrenchment is likely to be there and it's not just going to collapse on that, that basis. Veronica? I was doing some calculations on how much it's going to cost for uh, Ukraine to, um, to win the war. We have $40 billion from the United States. We have $1.2 billion from the EU, which is going to increase. We have the whole Ukraine economy that's uh, also directed towards fighting the um, uh, the invader, um, and for sure we're going to have an interest to support Ukraine in the long run. We have um, support at the individual level uh, within the European Union countries for Ukrainian refugees. There are a lot of resources that are going into this. We, there are the sanctions that are also costing Russia, so we have a lot of money bleeding out of Russia as well to support Ukraine in the war. The, the cost is, is phenomenal. World <laughs> hunger was one of them as well. Um, but that so far, there seems to be um, um, a, a lot of resources that are willing to be put to, uh, to, to, defeat, um, to defeat Russia. And um, on the China question, China is still deciding what to do. I think the fact that Russia is being 
pushed back is quite important in their decision-making process. I would like to underscore that it's not the whole of Central and Eastern Europe that is against uh, sanctions against Russia. This is a very um, Hungarian situation right now. Uh, if there are, there is a part of Europe that knows what Russian uh, menace means, um, uh, then it's Central and Eastern Europe more than than anyone else. Uh, China's economic ties are are very important, particularly in the Western Balkans, where they have a, a heightened presence. Um, but right now, they are experiencing a lot of economic problems themselves for the investments that they've done in the Road and Belt uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative. And we could talk about this uh, more. Um, but uh, I think China is still deciding what's they want to do uh, in, in the future. All right, Adrian, you're all that stands between us and cocktails. <laughs> then I shall make it short. Um, I, I just want to allude to what Veronica said, because I, I think it's a very interesting question that, that you asked about the, the importance of China in this whole conflict. And what, what strikes me is that currently it's probably more Russia and, and uh, the President Putin who has to think about how much am I going to deal with China and in what way? Because as it stands now, he would probably end up as a junior partner partner of um, China um, if his other endeavor in the Ukraine is not successful and the sanctions hit him too hard. Um, because the Russian economy is just on the ground, and China, being a rational player, would absolutely use this opportunity to make very clear what they want from from Putin. So I think right now it's. Putin himself has to be very careful how he's going to sort of balance these different relations um, regarding its own economy and the future um, economic relations with other countries. And as a last note, and uh, Veronica mentioned this already, I think China is also in a position where they monitor the situation right now. And they probably figure out how much are other countries willing to push back. And what, say, if we move on Taiwan, how much are they going to push back and what, what are their options and how many options are there. So they're in a position where they comfortably sit and watch. As I close this off, I want to thank Hans Gudnani and the Europe program here at Chatham House for their wonderful partnership with us that made this event possible in the first place. Uh, I'd like to thank Lauren, Emily and the membership events team because this has been fabulously well organized and we're incredibly grateful for the opportunity to speak with you. I'd like to thank our audience online for giving me the questions that I had at the start of this conversation and all of you for the questions that I had to make sure that it continued. Um, the only thing I'll leave you with is if you want an antidote to John Mearsheimer, uh, you should read the book by T.H. White uh, called The Once and Future King, which is a series of books, in fact, that was written during the Second World War to use the Camelot story in order to imagine a better peace, a peace that I think we managed to live for about 50 years or so, uh, and, and that now we find unraveling just as it happened to King Arthur in his Merry Nights. Uh, and the thing that I would take away from that story is that it is possible for us to recreate right and wrong, as Mohammed suggested, uh, but, but it will require strong institutions, which will be very difficult to build, either at the European level uh, or globally, uh, and very difficult to build, not just because of the international politics involved, but because of the domestic politics of each of the countries that will have to participate. I hope you'll take that message of domestic politics and its central importance home with you tonight, or at least upstairs for a drink, in which case you can let it go away. Uh, but, um, but that domestic politics story, I think, is going to be crucial because we all have roles to play in, in getting to a better place than we're in at the moment. So thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to talking with you more informally after the event.